And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of GMAT Club's YouTube series. My name is Evan. I'm a head moderator and MBA director at GMATclub.com. In today's session, we're going to continue a discussion we had two weeks ago, where we discussed this information around both the GMAT and the business school application process. Last time we had Michigan, Duke, and Yale. And I highly encourage you to watch that video. It has a lot of great information in it. Today, we have four equally as prestigious schools joining us to lend us their perspective. Joining me today to discuss, Lisa Killingsworth from Cornell Johnson School of Business, Yoselin Bugalo from the NYU CERN School of Business, Amy Mitson from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, and last but not least, Christy Heaton, join us from the <laughs> Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern University. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank right. you, Evan. Uh, really, really quickly, uh, since I want to make sure that our audience knows who you are, why don't we have a quick 30-second, one-minute introduction? Lisa, why don't we start with you? Wonderful. Uh, hi, everybody. Lisa Killingsworth. Um, I have been at uh, Cornell Johnson for a little over two and a half years now. I am the Director of Operations on the admission team, uh, so I help evaluate candidates uh, sit on the admission committee and do a variety of behind the scenes, th scenes things. Um, happy to to chat with you all today and look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Yoselin, how about you? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Yoselin Bugalo. I'm a director of admissions at NYU Stern School of Business located in New York City and happy to be joining as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Amy? And hello from Hanover, New Hampshire. My name is Amy Mitson. I'm a co-executive director in the admissions office at Tuck and have been at Tuck for about 20 years, spent half of that time in student services and now in admissions. Quite the background. And again, last but not least, Chrissy, I promise for our very first question, we're going to go in reverse order here and we're going to start with you. Oh man, I love going last. I usually just get to say like, ditto. Same, super easy questions. Um, <laughs> my name is Christy Heaton. Uh, I am one of the admissions officers at the Kellogg School of Management on the full-time admissions team. I've been there for eight years now. Um, it's actually my second time working at Kellogg. So uh, fun fact about me, I'm a what we call a boomerang, somebody who left and came back. And I focus on our two-year program and our JD MBA program. Wonderful. It's always good to see people go back. It shows that you love what you do and that it's a good workplace. Um, with that said, I have two quick announcements before we kick off our questions. One is to our audience and one is to our lovely panel. Okay, to our audience, you may notice after you're posting, it's not becoming visible. We are going to release each statement, potentially each question, uh, when we see fit. The founder of GMAT Club, BB, is the one who is regulating that side of it. And so we are trying to temper the questions that come out and we're going to save them to the end. With that said, if you do send a question in, it didn't disappear. It's still there. BB will be the one to post that if and when we have availability to do so. So please submit your comments. As you can see, somebody commented. They said, thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Uh, but know that those comments will be made available. Uh, as some are coming in right now. To our panel, uh, th this is more for my personal protection than anything else. These questions uh, that we have submitted to you, we didn't want to keep you in the dark, uh, but I ask that you please do not shoot the messenger on this one. These were vetted by our executive committee, of which I'm a part of. That said, there may have been dissension in the ranks. And frankly, as the sacrificial lamb here today to ask you these questions, I have to go with them. Please don't hold anything personally against myself or GMAC Club. Um, we neither will hopefully being angry either won't won't really get you far. Hopefully, especially against me, I like to think I'm a nice person. So please, please, please don't do that. Um, no ill will on this side, I, I promise. Uh, but with that said, we can dive into the questions. That was a horribly botched introduction, but so goes. Uh, <laughs> So our first question, Christy, we're going to start with you. We'll go in reverse order. So I'll follow up with Amy. And then uh, if we are starting to get similar answers, we'll probably shift to our second question and then go to Yoselin and Lisa. Uh, all is being equal. Let's say we have three applicants. One has a score, a GMAT score of a 720. Uh, 
Applicant number two has a 690 and a 720, and applicant three has a 700, 710, and 720. So one score, two score, three scores. Uh, Christy, in your mind, do the multiple scores have any impact on the applicant's profile? Same score, same score, same score. So we, you know, a 720 is a 720 is a 720. Whether you take it and it's your first score or your last score, um, I always encourage people, if you take the test multiple times, submit all of your scores. We'll always take your highest, but it shows effort and initiative and time on the applicant's behalf. So I, I those candidates are all the same in my mind. One, I can tell has taken the test multiple times and tried hard on it. And that tells me something about that candidate. But we always take the highest. So that's my my two cents. Wonderful. I'm sure our students are going to be happy to hear that. Amy, uh, you're nodding your head. I assume you agree with Christy's stance. I do. And so looking at the highest score is great. Looking at the track record of scores is great. Even if somebody submitted, you know, one score, took it again, and whether that test score goes up or down, it really shows a focus and a seriousness and an awareness that that candidate is shooting for something and wants to provide the best um, you know, the best score, it's, you know, an important piece of the evaluation process. And, and people are, you know, applicants are focused on doing well in that measure. Obviously, there are many other things that we look at, but um, nice to see all the scores if the candidates want to, you know, share that with us. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm sure our, I'm sure our audience will be very, very happy to hear that. Uh, Lisa and Yossel, and I don't want to cut you off, but I, I assume you both will agree with the sentiments given. So with that said, we'll skip down to question number two, which is, and uh, Yasin, we'll start with you on this one, the feeling of sort of inferiority with the GMAT being taken online. We've had a lot of students who feel that it may be viewed a little bit differently than the in-person GMAT. In the last video session we did, we were told repeatedly that if it's GMAT affiliated and approved, there shouldn't be any issues. Uh, how do you feel about that? How does NYU Stern feel about that? I would say we feel very similarly. I think that the GMAT online came at a time when the market really demanded it, right? So if you're going to le learn things in business school, it's about how markets shift and evolve to meet consumer demand or market demand. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, we were in close touch with GMAT as well as the other testing organizations to understand what this test meant, how it was being administered, what were the safeguards in place to prevent any issues happening, what recourses students had if they you know, had issues accessing the exam. And so we were part of those conversations and GMAT did a great job of keeping us very informed in the process. Um, and so for that, we felt comfortable taking the online exam and it's also something that I would say, you know, solved a, a problem with GMAT, which was that it wasn't always available to all students in all places. Um, and so for us, this was actually a great um, evolution of the exam because it could reach more people that were thinking about going um, and pursuing an MBA degree. So from our end, we absolutely take the online test. Um, it's also here to stay. So it's something that we have now um, made sure we're incorporating into our presentations to students to say you can take the online exam if it's what suits you best. Um, and certainly for many students who, you know, are in areas where the testing centers are booked months out or they just don't have access to testing centers, or frankly, they just don't feel comfortable being in a testing center in a home environment is a better opportunity for them to really showcase their skill sets. The online GMAT is, is a great option. So Yasuan, what I'm hearing is that you probably believe that this is a more equitable approach to take the GMAT and probably helps students in areas where GMAT hadn't considered prior. I think, yeah, I think I, I know, I think it's another opportunity to to take the exam, right? It's another way to do it instead of this sort of one size fits all, you have to walk into a testing center. The student now has more options um, and possibly more flexibility in terms of, of timing as well. Wonderful. Uh, Lisa, you were nodding your head a lot, as was I for that matter, uh, not to call you out. Uh, but uh, how do you feel and how does Cornell Johnson feel about it? Cornell is in an Ivy League, obviously well respected, not that any of the schools here aren't, uh, but some view Ivy League in a different light. Uh, what is Cornell's view of this and what's your view of this? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we were we were really grateful this year to GMAC to to have this option and then to see that this option was expanded even um, kind of later on in the year. And then, of course, to echo what Jocelyn said, um, you know, really opening up access, providing alternative options. Um, I think what we've seen from the online GMAT is that, um, you know, there's there's no difference in, in the test and we're evaluating it the exact same way that we would evaluate a, a walk-in test. Um, and I think it's been really wonderful. I think, um, you know, at my school and, and possibly other schools, I would imagine would, would echo this sentiment, but um, it, it's allowed us to see maybe applications from parts of the world where we don't see typically a lot of applications. I think we've all um, also seen a slight increase in applications this year. And I think part of that is, is the accessibility that the online GMAT has offered. So it's been really exciting for us. And we are also glad that it is here to stay, um, especially in, in a year that was quite challenging for many. So and if, if I, I could, could just yeah, add, Sorry, um, just on that, it was interesting to see um, when the test was first offered online and we had had students who had already applied and then, um, you know, they, they needed to retake the test for their application to be more competitive and what was offered was the online test. And so there was some trepidation there, but some candidates actually, um, you know, were, they improved their scores. They, they were very concerned about taking a different type of, you know, the delivery of the test was different, but it was a benefit. And I wonder if that, you know, like to the, to the point that was just made, takes a little bit of the nerves out of the process. Instead of going to the testing center, you can take it in a different environment. So just my two cents. And it was really interesting to see that some applicants did better when they took the um, online test. It was interesting this year. That's, that's great observation. Uh, and by the way, uh, Amy, please never apologize for uh, speaking up and interrupting me. The they are not here. Our audience is not here to see or hear me. They see from me and hear from me plenty. Believe me, they, they don't want to see or hear from me. They're they're here to hear about your expertise. Uh, all of you bring expertise, not, and so, it's just something that I could never match, I, nor could I claim or ever want to. So interrupt me as much as you want. That that's why you're here. <laughs> uh, but with that said, uh, I do want to sort of hit on the fact that Lisa and Yasem, you both mentioned that the online GMAT is here to stay. And I believe you're absolutely correct. In fact, our three schools from our last session talked about that. They believe that it's here to stay. Uh, with that said, I guess, Lisa, I can start with you. Do you feel that a student potentially using an online G GMAT three, four, five, six years from now, would Cornell look at that in a different way with an absence of maybe an AWA or an IR score versus somebody who took it more recently or maybe in a year or two where that's available online or maybe even in person? Certainly hard to, to see into the future and know exactly what um, <laughs> you know, shift in, and, and look a little bit different in our evaluation process going forward. But, um, you know, I think that we always want applicants to submit their best application possible. And if having access to an online GMAT and taking that from your home is what allows you to have your strongest application, that is what we are going to be most excited about. And that's what we want to see. Um, at the end of the day, we want, we want our applicants to have a strong application. Um, I know we're gonna we're gonna wade into this a little bit later, but um, the the test optional environment too is is something that um, will will also have an impact in the future. So I think what we're gonna see, um, of course, uh, are, are more options going forward as far as how mm -hmm. students can submit a strong application. Uh, but I don't foresee that if if the online GMAT continues to be accepted at Cornell, that we're going to evaluate that differently. Um, in the absence of, of that uh, of that portion of the test. So that applicant will not be the ugly duckling of the group then? No. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, does anybody else in our panel want to follow up with that? Uh, if not, we can move on uh, because I've been told that we have quite a few number, or oh my goodness, we have quite a few questions that have been submitted that are high quality. It turns out we're not going to be releasing them as they come in, we're just having it be an open chat, so to speak. 
Uh, so if no one else wants to comment, we could go through the standard set of questions we submitted and then hope we get to our audience. Um, and to the, to the person who said, I love Evan's bow tie, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was an interesting choice, but glad the audience likes it. Uh, so nobody wants to speak up. In that case, we can move on to the next question. Uh, Christy, you've been a little quiet. I know you sort of said that you wanted the easier questions. This isn't a softball question, unfortunately, uh, but I think it's an interesting one. Uh, how does Northwestern view the AWA? I, I, we got some, not mixed responses, but so, maybe some vague answers on how schools truly use the AWA and whether it has a tangible impact on an, applica an applicant's profile. We've had students who have uh, asked on our forum, hey, I got a 740, but my IR was four and my AWA was three. Should I retake the GMAT? Uh, so with that said, what what are your thoughts on that? Um. I've never seen us not take somebody because of an AWA score alone okay. or an IR score alone. Um, so I don't think those things stand in a vacuum. The process is more holistic in nature. You know, the AWA, what we're looking for, I mean, that's testing your writing ability. So we're also looking at your essays and how you express yourself through your essays. We're taking a look at your work experience and um, your interview and how you're expressing yourself. So the AWA can help round out that picture. Um, ultimately, we're trying to, to gauge, can this person be successful in the academic environment? And writing is going to be a part of that. So your AWA, if there's concerns about, gosh, these essays aren't very clear to follow. And ooh, their interview wasn't very clear to follow. And ooh, they have a really low AWA. That tells a different picture than really clear essays, really great interview, Great work experience, AWA, maybe not your strongest suit. So I wouldn't, you know, I don't, I don't take any of that stuff in a vacuum. It helps provide additional context. The same goes for the IR, you know. You maybe had a bad test day and your IR wasn't wasn't the best part of your application or your test, but we're gonna look and draw upon many other parts of your application to help round that out. So to me, when I'm looking at it, it helps evaluate different aspects that helps show different information. Ultimately, we're looking at kind of your overall score, your two sub scores, and then that AWA IR for us helps round out. I would say if you have a zero in it and there was a good reason you had a zero to let us know, I would not I would not stress about, oh my God, that one thing is gonna tank my whole application. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that made a lot of students very, very happy to hear. Uh, that that was a deciding factor. Uh, given that that was a semi-tricky question, I don't want to force that upon anybody else. Christy, I do apologize about that. Uh, Amy, Lisa, or Jocelyn, do either of you have a strong feeling about the AWA, potentially the IR, um, and how admissions officers feel about it? I'll just add that it's um, bringing out, you know, taking a look at your communication skill sets, particularly the AWA, and that is something that we have other checkpoints in your application that we're looking at, as, as Christy mentioned. And so if you do feel like that's an area where you can improve, it's something that your recommenders typically speak to. We all ask about communication skills, if not directly writing skills. So there's an opportunity there to think about it. Um, and also make sure that your essays are on point, that they have been edited, um, they have been proofread that you really feel like your voice comes through. So if you do if you do think that you need to um, hint or signal to the committee that you're strong in those areas, there are other places that you can do that in the application. Um, but also agree with Christy that it's not a deal breaker. It's not a, something that's gonna make us throw an application out. Not that we do that anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> Very fair. And by, by the way, I hope everyone watching knows that this is not an encouragement to ignore the AWA or the IR. It's still part of your profile. Uh, if you ignore it, that may not speak too kindly to work ethic or to some other portion of your profile or your character. So do not openly ignore this. I, I, yeah, I totally like I fully support all the the comments thus far and how we we're able to put that into context because of the other 
the incredible amount of information that we ask for in the application. So we can look to other things. But as Evan was just saying, you know, if it's, um, you know, don't ignore it. You don't want to have to explain something in your application. Like, why is there a zero? You know, what did you just not bother with it? You know, so you don't want the committee to ever have to fill in the blank for you. And why waste any space in the application kind of having to explain that? So just give it its time and and focused attention to it and and keep moving forward you know so that's all i have to say about that uh, actually amy if i could follow up on that comment um, sure so you mentioned you don't want the school filling in a blank when a school does do that so when tuck does fill in a blank what does that look like do you does tuck automatically assume the worst does tuck try and say, well, they did X, Y, and Z, therefore it's probably this. You try and give benefit of the doubt. What does that look like? So, you know, having to fill in the blank, that's just like, it's such a distraction. You know, I'm, I am reading an application from a very positive lens. You know, I'm looking for all the reasons to admit this person. I'm looking for all the reasons why they fit in, why they want to come to Tuck, why they're ready. I'm looking for all of that. And so, if I see something that's a little bit of an outlier and I have no explanation, it is a distraction to me from the candidacy that somebody wants to put forward. Like, so, you know, so just being thoughtful in the application, I think it was Yaslin who mentioned like proofreading, you know, taking your time, you know, that, that can all help with these other aspects of the application. So no one would ever have to fill in the blank. Like dear candidate, imagine yourself as you know, in, in my shoes a little bit in presenting your candidacy to a committee, you know, if, mm -hmm. if there's a work gap, I want it to be explained. If, you know, maybe you ran out of time on the test and couldn't get to a certain section, whatever the case may be, but those things are truly are, can be a distraction, Evan, and kind of take away from that path of positivity that I'm on as, as everything is kind of coming together and I'm reading through all layers of the application. Okay, so if I may recap, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, you're you're asking students to not give you a reason, so to speak, to move away from give me a reason to say yes. I, I mean, it's it's that's some of it, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how to follow up on the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just, I wanted to make sure I was clear on it. Um, I think you were very clear. Uh, and I think that sheds some light on uh, the process a little bit that I hadn't actually considered prior to you making the comment. So thank you for um, making it. Uh, I'm sorry, it was off the cuff. Uh, <laughs> but I think our students will get a lot out of that. I know I did. Uh, but with that said, we can go back to our more standardized uh, questions. And this section, this set, this question in particular is near and dear to my heart, which is the alternative tests and the applying with out of score altogether. Then uh, I actually would like to hear from all four schools because all four of you take a different approach to this. Uh, Yoselin, I know NYU Stern is flexible on this. I know you guys accept the GRE, I believe the LSAT, MCAT. Uh, do you guys accept the MCAT? We do. We accept the MCAT as well as the DAT. Um, and, and part of this is because we have dual degrees with um, our dental school, our medical school, our law school, as well as a few others. So we have been seeing these scores in our applicant pool for many years now and um, are able to, to really um, determine how to center the score in terms of the evaluation of the application. Um, and so these students do well in our program. They have um, an exceptional experience while they're at Stern as well as the remainder of the other graduate program. And so for us, it became um, you know understanding that we could use these scores uh, to a degree with our dual degree students let's see about using it with our other students as well um, who may have thought about med school once upon a time or law school once upon a time and now a few years down uh, into their careers have realized that an MBA is the kind of degree that they want to pursue so we're able to really use those scores in the application process. Um, we also accept the executive assessment which is um, a new test that's also or new-ish test I'll say that uh, was made by the same organization that has created the GMAT and so they're also a great resource but you know we do believe in the flexibility of testing in terms of bringing students to the process and meeting them where they are. And if I may follow up with you a little bit on that how is a student who applies with an MCAT or an LSAT so how is that score graded 
Is it just thrown into a general category? Is it compared to the school's average within the law school or the medical school? How, how do you guys try and identify think, that strength? Right. So we have, um, particularly with the MCAT and the LSAT, where the sections don't line up with like the, the typical verbal quant, uh, as you would with the GMAT, um, we evaluate each of those scores separately. And so we're not comparing it to the law school profile or the medical school profile. Um, we're looking that in that within our own um, student body. We're also relying on the other typical characteristics like the GPA, the quality of work experience. So that all kind of assembles the pictures. I'm sure many of my other colleagues will also indicate, you know, we do employ a holistic admissions, but we are not comparing that against data from any of our other graduate schools. Good to know. Um, not that I believe any in our audience are potentially applying with an MCAT or an LSAT. Uh, I know they will be with a GRE, which is a bit more standardized, and I'll ask about that. But uh, I know our audience will be a little happier, happier to know that uh, I know Cornell, NYU, Northwestern all have fantastic top tier law schools. And to, for someone to apply with an LSAT to the business school there, if it were to be applied to those schools in terms of averages, it, it'd be a very steep public climb. So that is good to know. Uh, Lisa, why don't we come to you with, with a similar question. I know Cornell, the law school is accepting the GMAT. So if anybody does well in the GMAT and they potentially want to become a lawyer, that is an option. Uh, but I d believe I spoke to Eddie and I believe he said that the business school is not accepting the LSAT and that you're still very much GMAT GRE based. Uh, how is Cornell viewing that? And are you potentially looking at alternatives? Sure. So uh, we are currently accepting the GMAT, the GRE. And then this season, we also uh, had a process by which a student could request a test waiver. Um, so this season, it has been one of those combinations for each applicant. Um, we, we don't currently accept the LSAT as part of our evaluation process for the MBA application. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not sure what that might look like going forward. Um, we are certainly evaluating how we can make it easier for candidates to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to submit an application and um, try to meet candidates where they are. So certainly there is opportunity in the future if a candidate has an LSAT, maybe that will be part of our consideration process. Um, with the JD program, of course, our dual degree program options with the law school, uh, there are a variety of combinations. Um, as you mentioned, they, they accept the GMAT. Um, our law school, we also have uh, options for uh, students who start their first year at the law school. As, as long as they maintain a good academic standing, they are waived out of submitting a test to us entirely. So um, there's a variety of combinations that, that will work for students based on their personal situations. Mm -hmm. um, I think as far as whether to take the GMAT or the GRE, we always tell students that um, if, you've, if you've not necessarily gotten a score on one of the tests versus the other, you might want to try the other. Some students are stronger on one test versus the other. Um, so if you're not happy with your score on the GMAT, give the GRE a try. It might be better suited to your skill set um, and your test strength. So um, that's something to consider. Uh, when when deciding between which test to take. Thank you for uh, saying that because that flows into uh, my question for Amy, which was going to be uh, GMAT versus GRE, because I know Tuck has a very similar mindset to Cornell. Uh, I don't want to speak for you on that, but I, from my research, I believe you guys are on a similar footing when it comes to your beliefs uh, or what you accept at this time. Uh, so. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So applicants are required to submit a, a GMAT or a GRE. Um, and, you know, the committee is very familiar with both. Um, and, you know, they're, it is something that, um, you know, it, it's up to the applicant what they want to do. And we accept both. And sometimes we see people who've taken one and then also taken the other and submitted both of those scores. And so totally up to the applicant. Um, and the, the committee loves to see all that information and, and can move forward with the, the evaluation, but still um, a GMAT or a GRE is required for applying to Tuck. Amy, I hate to fall because I've been doing it a lot with you and I apologize. Um, when it comes to GMAT versus GRE, let's say somebody gets a 620 on the GMAT, which is 
it, it is a bad score, but it's not an elite score. But let's say they get a 320 or a 330 on the GRE. Would you then encourage that student to submit both test scores? Or would you encourage that student to submit the test score that is closest to Tux average? A great question. And and with that, sometimes people do um, just submit both. They, they send us everything, right? Um, but you know, when you take a look at the class profile and see the averages posted for the GMAT or the GRE or whatever schools provide, um, you know, submitting the test score where you're where you're getting close to that average or where you perform most strongly, um, you know, that that's probably um, a good score to to submit. But um, yeah, we know we know people have different journeys with each of those tests. And um, yeah, taking a look at our our class profile and seeing where that score fits in and how close it is to the average, um, definitely presenting the strongest score is a, is a good thing for the overall um, evaluation. Terrific, thank you for that clarity. Christy, you're in your favorite position here. You're going last. Um, Same. Uh, <laughs> so Kellogg requires GMAT or GRE. Um, doesn't matter to us what you take. Um, we this year allowed people to apply at the deadline if they were having a hard time getting into a testing center or their test was scheduled after the deadline, but they wanted to be in that round. We had a grace period. So, um, you know, we're cognizant of some of the delays that are still happening for applicants and we'll work with them to kind of get their test in. But right now, one of those two tests um, is required. And we evaluate based on the test that you submit. So if you are applying with a GRE, we're taking a look at your GRE and your percentiles and how you performed on that test. If you apply with a GMAT, the same goes. So um, very similar to what what Amy already said about kind of applying and which to apply for and submitting information. Um, doesn't matter to us just as long as you have one. Wonderful. So as BB just brought up, we are going to start taking questions, which uh, none of you have prepared for, neither have I. Uh, these are questions that have been asked by our audience as well as by our forum. So BB, uh, please release the questions. All right, first question. Is a GRE score converted to the GMAT equivalent or is a GRE judged against GRE average among all applicants to this program? Or is it percentile based? Uh, I think we touch on that a little bit in that it's based on averages. Um, and Amy, I believe you mentioned that. Uh, does anybody in, in this panel want to take that question? Well, we, we wouldn't really do a, a straight conversion. Um, of course, you can see the conversion charts um, on the ETS website, and, and you can look at the GMAT in comparison. Um, but uh, I would say for our committee, we're pretty well versed after looking at years and years of GRE scores. And so um, we're going to look at that score um, and the, the percentiles there and keep moving forward. Wonderful. I absolutely believe that was the right uh, answer given what you told me earlier. Uh, next question, how much do individual score breakdowns between the quant and the verbal section matter? So for example, if a student gets a 730, but their verbal score was 47 and their quant was a 38, for our audience, I, please don't cite me on that one. I don't know if that's a 740 or 730 or whatever I said. Um, just pulling numbers out of thin air here. Uh, do schools take that into consideration? Uh, who would like to take that one? I can take that one, Evan. Wonderful. So I think we look at the overall score, so how well you've done. Um, and as my colleagues mentioned, we'll take a look at the overall highest score, typically from only one sitting. Um, the verbal and the quant scores individually do matter as they show us where the strengths or the areas of growth may be in your application. So if you are you know, pulling highly in one category over the other, you may wanna think about how you can express your strengths in that in that one part where you may be scoring lower in other parts of your application. So we do look to see, um, you know, as a measure of your quantitative ability, how well you've done in that section. We often see that reflected in other parts of the application as well. So it's typically not a standalone as well as with your verbal. So we're seeing, you know, your recommenders talking about your strong communication skills or seeing strong essays. And so you typically in my experience, when you see 
one score being higher than the other, that strength is reflected also in other areas of the application. But really look at it strategically to say, if I do have a lower verbal or quant score, where can I also provide additional evidence to the admissions committee that I um, have an opportunity to grow in this area or that I've taken steps to grow in this area? Um, taking a look at what your job responsibilities are, how you can highlight those in the resume, for example, um, is an opportunity to do so. So we definitely do look at those different sections and they do matter. Wonderful. Did anybody else in our panel feel strongly about that and want to add any follow-up? Christy, you're saying no. Lisa, no. Amy, no. Wonderful. <laughs> that makes it easy. We can move on. Uh, this question is from Annie. For international students, undergrad was taught in a non-English language who have a GPA that doesn't directly translate to the American GPA. Is the GMAT or GRE more important than the GPA itself? Okay, Christy shaking her head no. So Christy, I'm going to call on you for this. <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's more important. First of all, we we take GPAs as they are. So if you have a four, if you went to school in another country and they use a 10 point scale or a seven point scale or a five point scale, we're going to use the scale to which your university uses. We're not going to try to translate it because it just it doesn't work that way. So we're pretty familiar with with you know reading international applications and universities and that country and which are stronger universities and majors that might be common and and what gpa ranges are typical for those universities so i wouldn't say the gpa and gmat one matters more than the other for an international student um, they're both important they're both data points so um you know if one data point is lower that goes for all applicants you know you probably want to explain if undergrad wasn't your strongest it's a data point you're never going to change so you probably want to address it <laughs> Um, but it's not going to matter necessarily that it was international versus domestic um, and make one way more than the other. I'll, I'll jump in just with my agreement and support of that comment and also say that we will dig into the content of that transcript and see what what type of courses you took. Were you challenging yourself? You know, we want to get an idea of what you were like in your previous life as an undergrad student. So the the component of the, the um, transcript is also important, so. Wonderful, you know, Christy, that it was so interesting, and Amy, thanks for that follow-up. Uh, you mentioned that you take the GPA as it comes in. Uh, on our forum, a lot of students fret about converting their GPA to 4 to sort of see how they line up, and I'm getting a lot of shaking our heads of no here saying, uh, maybe they shouldn't do that. And... Don't do it. Don't convert your GPA. <laughs> don't don't do waste it. your time. It's not worth it. We don't do it. Don't you do it. <laughs> so that is fantastic to know. Uh, my goodness, our students are, if they, uh, well, I hope they take a lot of things away from this, but uh, if they take one thing away from a time-saving perspective, I hope that's it. Uh, because that's a big one. A lot of students are worried about that. Uh, and they use random websites, they use sketchy sources to try and do it. So thank you for that clarification. Uh, our next question is, since the GMAT online does not have the AWA, are applicants giving the, taking the GMAT online at any disadvantages compared to applicants taking the physical GMAT? Uh, BB, where I answered this, the answer I believe was resounding no across the board that because it is GMAC certified, there is no difference between the two. Uh, but I don't want to speak for our panel. All right, we're getting thumbs up. Excellent. Um, all right, next question. This is kind of a long one. I expected to crash and burn on my first GMAT attempt. This is terrible. Uh, <laughs> we're starting off really positive. Um, how late can I retake the GMAT? Is it okay to retake a few days before a deadline? And what if my AWA is not available when I submit my application? Um, who would like to help our worried student? Because I well, really feel first for this of person. all, <laughs> don't expect to crash and burn. That's a terrible mindset. Shift your mindset and have some confidence in yourself. You're going to be great. Um, <laughs> that's just my two cents. I we always say like, we'll take your highest test if you plan to retake it. Um, you can go ahead and apply with that one. If you plan to retake it, let us know and put it in your application. And if you do put it in your application, make sure you follow up because it's always kind of a question mark if you're like, oh, I want to take it in April and then April comes and goes and we have no test score. Um, so if you plan to retake it, go ahead and, and let us know. If you don't have the AWA at that time, submit it when you do. And the other thing I would say is if you do 
let's say, not get a score that you are really excited about and you think it's going to impact your application, you can always consider delaying to the next round to take your test again and know what you're working with so that you can tailor your application around that if it's a concern. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Would anybody like to follow up with that? I would also just, um, two things, just make sure that you're able to apply with a self-reported score if you're going to take that test um, a few days before the actual application deadline as, you know, you don't want to be in a case where you can't submit the score until you have the official report. Um, for the online test, it does come very quickly. For the physical test, it can take a few more days, so just to be aware of that. And also be aware of the time um, in between your testing times. So for some, that's 30 days. For others, it may be shorter or longer. But just make sure that you build that timing into your process. Um, but as Christy said, like, walk into it knowing you're going to knock it out of the ballpark. Wonderful. On to our next question. And thank you for helping stay or thank you for the positivity. I'm sure that the person who asked that question is feeling a lot better. At least I hope they are. Uh, if not, please reach out to me on the forum and I'd be happy to discuss uh, further ways to help stabilize that confidence. Uh, with that said, moving on to the next question. Are you able to see what other schools, what other schools we are sending our GMAT and GRE scores to? And doesn't matter if we designate the recipient school at the time of the test or at a later time. So I'll, I believe I can answer the second part and say, no, it doesn't matter if you designate the schools right then and there or not. Uh, but can you guys see the other schools that uh, they are sending their source to? Uh, why don't we start? Uh, why don't we have uh, Lisa? You haven't spoken in a while. It's you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um... You know, I, this is an interesting question. I'm wondering if there's a, a deeper concern about about what you think we might be perceiving from from this portion of your application. I think, um, as admissions professionals, we we know you're applying to multiple schools, um, and we expect that, and we we hope that you're doing that, right? We hope that you're exploring um, different possibilities for yourself and leaving yourself um wonderful options to to choose from when you when you get to the point of of evaluating your offers of admission um so it's very common to do that i think it depends honestly on the version of the test that you submit um currently with an online gmat score um where we're not seeing any other test submissions um for for other programs i think if you submit a traditional paper format uh, depending on how you choose to send that to us it might indicate some of the other programs that that you're applying to i will say um, with us at, at Cornell uh, as well, in our application, we have a question where we ask you this question. So um, you have the opportunity to disclose if you if you want to indicate where else you're applying. Um, it's optional. You don't have to. Um, the reason I think it is helpful for us to kind of see that information is, is we like to see your decision making process. Um, if you're interested in sustainability, are you are you targeting programs that are really strong in that? So things like that, I, I think, are helpful for us to see during the the evaluation process. But um, this is not not a large piece, or or really anything we're taking into consideration when looking at your test score. It's your test score that is important. Oh, that is good to hear. Um, I think the person asking was getting at uh, not they they were trying not to hurt. A school they potentially have the top choice, but maybe came around to them later on, and the j just a view of that. Uh, so we have tough uh, kids. Don't worry about, about us. <laughs> and and we've seen it for, for years. And just to echo, like we we hope you are a applying to you know apply to a few schools, or if you're really focused on one, that's fine. Like there's no no judgment there. If I was in your shoes, there are probably a few programs I would also be interested in and applying to. Um, and so we no no harm there if we were to see that information. That, that's good to know. Again, optics are big, at, at least to a student. And I think they believe the same for the schools. But it's good to know that that isn't taken into consideration. Uh, moving on to our next question. I scored a GRE verbal of 167, quantitative 168. I'm going to assume that's a good score. But AWA was only four, which was below the AWA average. Would this AWA four be considered a disadvantage? Um, I, I believe we covered this as well with a couple of you guys. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the consensus was AWA wouldn't be the thing that breaks an applicant's profile. 
Correct. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> and Christy's getting creative. I'm, make, I'm making myself signs because I'm like, I agree. <laughs> you know, thumbs up, yeah. thumbs down, frowny faces <laughs> work too. Um, <laughs> I love how creative this group is. Uh, I, I not that the other group I did what wasn't creative, but from a conversational piece, the ability to continue to move forward like this, I love it. You guys have been so fun to work with. Um, so our next question, uh, isn't the admissions committee worried that if score, uh, that scores tend to be a reflection on how well versed they are at least taking out some standardized tests? How do you as a committee account for someone who is not a good test taker? Uh, and who would like to answer that? I think Amy, we heard from you last time, but you hadn't really uh, spoken it for a while, so I'd like to hear from you on this. So, uh, um, yeah, yep, yeah, ha happy to jump in. Um, often we see I've I've seen um, applicants who submit a test score, and um, you know if it's below the average or lower than they expected, um, and they they say they're not a good test taker. You know, what are the 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 test is one indication. I'm not going to look at testing performance and think, okay, this person isn't ready for the MBA classroom and isn't ready for future tests. But I'd say to you, the applicant, what is it that you can point the committee toward to show the strength? Um, and so the test, the test is just one piece of a much larger review, as we've all said. And so I'm going to look to other things to build my confidence about your readiness for the MBA. So you know, if, if there's some further explanation you want to provide, you can, of course, do that in the application. But, um, you know, there, there's there's probably a lot more behind this question, but I'll just say in general, point the committee toward something that does reflect a strength and does reflect your readiness for the MBA classroom. And I think that, um, that that's very helpful. And I'd chime nice. in to also add that we may talk about averages in this conversation, but for many of us, it's a really a range that we're looking at and you can find the ranges. Typically we report at 80% of what our test taking ranges might be. And so you do see the high, not the highs and the lows, but typically where again, 80% of our scores are, you will see those numbers, you know, have, have quite a few uh, scores in between them. And so thinking about how you fit within that score. And, and I think Amy had a great point. Where can you point to your strengths in the other application? But Definitely encourage you to think about it as a range instead of just an average that you need to hit. Good to know. Uh, to our audience, really quickly, BB is not going to post, nor am I going to comment on questions that are profile evaluation questions. For example, saying you're X amount of years old with X amount of years of experience with a GPA of Y. We're not going to discuss those questions here today. I encourage you to go to our forum to submit questions to our uh, to the consultants on the forum, to ask students about their experiences. We have students from these schools who are on the forum who can probably give you a clear indicator as to where you stand in that process. Uh, with that said, this is actually an interesting question that, that I hadn't considered either. If a candidate has an undergraduate and a master's degree, are both GPAs weighted equally, or is one more important than the other? Who would like to take this one? Uh, Lisa and Chrissy haven't heard from you two in a little bit. Would either of you like to take this? I would be happy to jump in on this. Um, Wonderful. I think I think there's there's a multiple ways to look at this question, and it is a really interesting question. Um, an undergraduate GPA or any GPA for that matter is a important indicator of success in a graduate program. Um, of course, it it can directly relate to how well you're going to perform. Um, in general, but that being said, um, it's also sometimes really interesting to see or, or kind of nice to see someone who maybe had a lower GPA or, or had some some sort of experience that they struggled with during a particular semester during undergrad, um, and then to see them be very successful in a master's program. So we're we're kind of going to be looking to the undergraduate GPA, um, looking at the graduate GPA, especially if, if there's a differential in, in the, the kind of the overall GPA score. Um, that being said, um, as I think as my, my colleague mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking to, 
to look uh, for, for things to admit you to the program. So if we're, we've got an undergraduate GPA and we've got a master's GPA and one is lower than the other, um, you know, we're going to be looking at your courses, we're going to be looking at the semester and kind of diving into your transcript a little bit more. Um, however, you know, they're both uh, valuable data points when, when assessing how, how you might do in the program and that, that is something that we care about a lot. We want students in the program who are going to do well and, and feel good about that. And to give credit where credit is due, Amy was one who mentioned that. Uh, but whoever was speaking, please continue. My apologies. Oh, it was me. I was just going to say, everybody who's applying has an undergraduate GPA. And so in a sense, that master's GPA is an additional data point. Um, I wouldn't say they're weighed differently, but when we're taking a look at applications, we're making sure we're evaluating consistently. And GPA is one of those consistents, right? You have to have a test score, you're applying with an undergraduate degree. And so it's sort of, um, I wouldn't say the weight is what it, what it is, but it's one of those factors that's consistent among all of our applicants. Um, and when we're looking at GPAs, it's like where you went to school, what classes you took, what grades you received. Maybe you took a master's degree that was really technical and your undergrad wasn't so technical. Well, that's going to tell us something different about your application and we're going to evaluate it. But it's it's the undergrad GPA that's going to be consistent for everybody that we're really going to look at. And then that master's degree is going to help round out a picture for you as a unique applicant. Thank you for that uh, follow up, Christy. Um, moving on to our next question. Our first, uh, okay, will schools continue to expect a surge of applications for the upcoming fall? If yes, are schools looking to expand class size? Uh, who would like to take that one? Uh, Amy, would you like to? I can jump in quickly and say um, we're, we're not looking to expand our class for the fall. Um, it, it's interesting for the applicants who, who are, um, here with us today, probably very well informed and know that there were a lot of schools whose applica applications were up this past year. Um, our applications were up this past year. And just keeping in mind, I mean, for us in particular, they were up over a down year. And so it's not like they're an app, it's absolutely skyrocketed. There have been increases, but I, I'd say it's a little bit more of there's recovery in that too for many schools over down prior years or flat applications in a prior year. So just a little bit of perspective from Tuck specifically. Um, so just class size, about 285, 290 students at Tuck um, and are not looking to expand the class size. Hopefully we'll have a robust pool of applications, um, but I, I I wonder if we'll see. Fit. It's, it's like we need a crystal ball for that one. I don't exactly know. Um, if someone else knows, please tell me. <laughs> Agree. Jocelyn, I haven't, okay, you gave a thumbs up, but I'd like to hear you speak on this because unfortunately we haven't heard from you in a question or two. Uh, what, what's in my Eastern's position on this? Um, you know, someone um, sent me an article that compared admissions in, in undergrad specifically to trying to land a helicopter on an aircraft carrier in the middle of a hurricane um, because there are so many factors that have changed so quickly in part because of the pandemic and in part because of other factors. And so I think I echo Amy here to say, if I had a crystal ball and I could see what was coming up ahead, I, you know, I, <laughs> I'd pay good money for that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we, we don't know. Um, there's still for many of us a decent amount of time until our first deadline. And so, um, you know, we don't necessarily have any data points that correlate to an increase or a decrease in application. So um, we are definitely in a wait and see game until, uh, you know, until that application deadline. And uh, honestly, I think that's what happens every year. We we have sort of our models and what we think could happen. But each year we're surprised. Some populations are up, some populations are down. And, um, you know, much of our analysis is really looking back at the year that happened versus trying to necessarily predict what's going to come through the door. So, you um, you know, I wish I had a straightforward answer to this. It would make my job a lot easier. But <laughs> unfortunately, we, you know, we take a look at what comes in in the deadline and then go from there. I have to say, if I had a crystal ball and I could see the future, I'd be very happy too. My investments would do incredibly well. Oh, I'd be a yeah, very well, happy person. Exactly. Uh, Full scholarship <laughs> rights for everybody, right? If you could do that, you just figure out how to work that out. Absolutely. 
Of course. So we are officially out of questions. Uh, BB, again, the founder of GMAT Club, wants everyone to remember that we are going to do an MBA spotlight with these schools in June. So if your question wasn't answered or you want to get to know these schools better, please join us for those events and you can talk to them then. Uh, I do want to wrap up with a couple of things. One, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. It was truly a pleasure and an honor. Uh, it's not easy to take an hour of your day to come talk with us, and we do understand that. So thank you so much. Uh, to conclude, I want to give each of you an opportunity. Do you have any last comments, uh, maybe something that you want to hit on that you didn't get to or something that stuck out that you wanted to reiterate before we close? Uh, Lisa, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think even just following up on our on our kind of last uh, question and conversation there, um, going forward, uh, next application cycle, um, don't let the thought of increased applications deter you from submitting an application. Um, I think it's really important that you realize that we want to review your application. We want to evaluate applications from all sorts of different backgrounds, industries, um, experience levels. Um, each of us are, are attempting to enroll diverse classes with diverse experiences and, and your application could be an important piece to that. So um, don't don't look at the the kind of application environment in the MBA world and and let that dissuade you from submitting an application. Very nice. Yoselin, how about you? I think Lisa said it perfectly. I have no other things to add. And bring the optimism. We're ready. <laughs> All right, Amy, bring the optimism and Christy, your favorite position going last. Same. Ditto. Wonderful. I love working with this group. <laughs> this was so much fun. Again, I'm so ha glad you guys came together for this. Uh, I One last comment. To, uh, I mentioned our forum has a lot of Indian exposure. Uh, a lot of our students are Indian, and I know they are suffering quite a bit. Uh, so to, our, to those watching and to our panel, um, my, my sympathies and condolences and prayers, but we on GMAT Club have had students who have begun organizing events to try and raise money to help with the COVID outbreak down there. So if you want to go to our forum, uh, there was stuff posted in the general chat. There may be links out there as well throughout the forum. Please give it a look and see if some of the offerings that our students are giving in exchange for a donation to India, may, may that's something you're interested in. But with that said, uh, thank all of you so much for joining us here. We can't wait to see you in June, and I know our students can't wait to see you there as well. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.